Hi, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Brain Talks. I'm Deborah Kahn, founder of Being Patient. Today, we're going to talk about living well with dementia. Um, it's not a phrase you often hear uh, once someone gets a dementia diagnosis. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety um, about life around the person with dementia and their families. So today, we've invited um, Tipa Snow back um, to join us. Tipa is an occupational therapist who specializes in dementia care um, from my in my personal opinion, Tipa is one of the best people to talk to because she really can explain what's happening inside the brain and apply that to behavioral strategies. So Tipa, thanks so much for joining us and, um, and welcome back. My pleasure, it's good to be back and it's great to have an opportunity to talk about this idea of living well. Okay, so I wanna start first with that diagnosis, the day everybody dreads where you know you might have gotten an mci diagnosis and now you, the doctor is saying it's full-blown alzheimer's okay. and you are on that road that is just such a crushing moment i mean we've had that happen in my family um and you really feel like as a family almost like you have to go into isolation because what does this all mean and how uh you know how do you even digest this so yeah. let's talk, start first with, with that diagnosis and really what how people can cope. Yeah, so we have a person who's just received the information and the evidence says once a person hears, it looks like you, you, you do actually have some form of dementia. Nothing else after that is absorbed. Um, and so the person who's living with the diagnosis at that point their brain is either going into fright, flight, fight, hide, or seek mode. So their primitive brain is now in gear. And so fright is, oh no, the anxiety kicks in and all systems, they quit breathing, they quit thinking, they can't take in data. Fright, that was that. So we now we have flight. They just want to get out of there. I don't want to hear about this. I don't want to talk about this enough, enough, enough. Out. Let's get up. Let's go. I need to go because their brain says, mm, let's get out of here. This is a really dangerous place. And if they don't do it that way, they check out. Um, so the brain flights from the information and they shut down on data intake. And the third is the fight. And so this is where I don't think I have dementia. This is ridiculous. I, this is absurd. That's just one test, just one test. And so you get some kickback because the brain is going, no, 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 no. And it's fighting with this word, this, this condition. And then the next two things that people don't think about is hide. Got to hide. I've got to hide. I've got to hide. I, I can't let anybody see this. And then finally, seek. Well, I don't believe you. I want to talk to somebody else who knows what they're talking about. So I'm seeking another. This can't be it. It's got to be something else. Well, that's the person living with dementia. But let me just say, family members are experiencing a parallel. And the parallel, ah, uh, oh, no, 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 no. That can't be. I so hope not. Ah, uh, really? It is? No, I don't want to hear that. So this fright has become, yikes. They've got it, but my life is going to change. <clears throat> and then they can't think anymore because my life is going to change. And then the flight is, ooh, I can't. Oh, oh, no, I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this for them. I don't want this for me. It's going to change everything. I, I can't do this. I can't. I mean, I can't. I can't. Um, I don't want to talk about this anymore. I, I don't want to hear about this anymore. And this could be a wife, husband, and then the daughter or the son being there trying to be supportive. And mom's going, I'm not talking about this anymore. Let's just let's just stop talking about this. And then we have the fight where we have one of the family members saying, this is ridiculous. You guys are making mountains out of molehills. I just don't think it's that. So there's still this, I mean, one of us may get there, but not everybody. And then the hide, the first thought often is, oh my God, what is, is everybody gonna, who do I tell? Who do I not tell? Um, this is, what about our friends? What about, and what about his work? What, 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 you know, ooh, ooh. And so this hide phenomena and this seek is, I wanna, I wanna talk to somebody else. There's gotta be something we can do. I mean, surely there's something we can do. 
So what you describe is that initial reaction um, to an Alzheimer's diagnosis. And I've often heard um, people have said to me, oh, my mom, it's MCI, almost like, oh, phew, it's a relief. It's only MCI. And it's that transition to Alzheimer's that is so difficult for yeah. people. But what you're describing is human nature. We all feel that way upon a diagnosis. It's not that unusual to feel ashamed, yeah. embarrassed, confused, and, and want to isolate yourself. Yeah. Let me ask you the question a different way. How should we be acting? I mean, all ah, of those things you just described yeah. is human nature. Yeah, so so we you're thinking it is dementia. So so talking about dementia. So tell me a little bit about what you're thinking about having dementia. How do you feel right now? I mean, I just gave you a word, but how are you doing? I mean, Let's think about it. How distressed are you with hearing that word? How how would you say you're going to be able to sleep tonight having heard that word? How are you feeling about social contact having heard that word? Um, what about taking care of your body and your brain at this point when you hear that word? And finally, what about eating well and drinking well? What do you think about eating and drinking as you hear that word? because I think we should be doing more of a support assessment rather than simply saying, oh, yeah, you've got this awful diagnosis. And instead, when you hear that you're living with dementia, tell me about how stressed are you feeling? What are you thinking about how well you'll sleep tonight? What are you thinking about your social contacts? What are you thinking about what you wanna do for your body and your brain to keep yourself as fit or better fit than you are now. And what do you think about what you want to eat and drink, given that condition that you're living with? Because what I want to find out is from a support position is where are you right now? So you, you have, there's so many things in that I love and that we have to unpack, but I want to start with the social aspect because that's probably the first thing that I, and I noticed within my own family, you know, my sister and I, when we go out to dinner with other family members or friends with my parents, my sister and I actually sit right next to my mom because I feel like we feel the need to protect her, you know, like, Oh, what if she repeats herself one too many times? Like we, we we're the ones who can pick up, but what should you do from the perspective? perspective of a caregiver um, looking after someone with dementia, you want to keep them socially active because that's good for them. Um, so should we be should we assume the role of protectors or should we just let it be? So one of the important this really good question, and I think one of the things is not so much a protector, but a facilitator. And so for most people, most people are right side dominant. So it's a really great idea for the support person to start sitting to the left because it means that if the person is right side dominant, they're more comfortable speaking to their right side, interacting to their right side. So if there's going to be a third party, I want the third party on the preferred side because my mom or my dad or my husband is going to be more comfortable with me, the known entity, on the less skilled side. But it allows me to look across and make eye contact with the visitor or the third party, if need be. And I position my face so that my mom's face and my face line up in their eyesight. And so mom will think the visitor's looking at her, but the visitor might be actually looking at me for a cue. Or I could say, hey, mom. She was asking you, I think, sort of what you were thinking about doing later tonight, not not yesterday, but tonight. And we had talked about maybe going um, to watch a movie or maybe going to the store. So I think that's maybe would you were you thinking going to the store or the movie? So it allows me, hey, mom, to intervene without it feeling like vulture or interfering with that interaction or having somebody come at the person from their non-dominant side, which is more tends to be more distressing and, and alarming because I can't really pay attention to both sides equally anymore. 
So that was such great advice. I, I, I actually have never, no one's ever told me that before. And I can see the logic in that. That's just brilliant advice. Um, you don't want to isolate the person and talk for them. You want to almost be there as comfort, but also someone who can facilitate conversation should they get lost in the conversation. Right. And the other thing, because of that positioning and that flexibility is you can go, oh, hey, mom, or oh, Mary, there was something that mom and I had talked about earlier. Let me think, what was that? Oh, it was something about what you guys used to do on Saturdays when you guys would get together with at the golf. And, and so whatever the old memories that mom and I had talked about sort of ahead of this thing in the moment that may dry up. But if I can lay it out there and then the two of them pick up the threads, then they're woven and that's great because that's exercising the brain. That's taking the brain with old data, new data, put it together, have a conversation. And I have some threads in the back of my head that I can pull out, things I know that the two of them have in common and see if we do that, if it can stimulate some of that old crystallized and personal knowledge that can then come forward without a lot of word seeking from the part of the person. If this is some of their first outings after the diagnosis where they may have awareness and their anxiety is up, um, what if she notices? What if she says something? So you're worried about her noticing that you are having trouble finding the words? Yeah. So are you, are you thinking that if she notices, you'll feel uncomfortable, she'll feel uncomfortable? Again, I think one of the things that we're starting to recognize with people who do have a level of awareness is that involving them in conversations before doing something is important because they need sometimes to work through things and rehearse before their first try is in front of a live jury and they feel judged. And the reality is there's still a lot of stigma with this thing called dementia and people are afraid because they didn't know they had it until they have it and they have it. And now it's like, are people, I, I don't want people thinking I'm an idiot. I mean, do you really, do you think I can go out and be okay? I mean, people have fear. I mean, literal fear that they'll make a mistake and it will just reinforce everything. So doing a little rehearsal ahead of time can make a difference. So I, I want to frame this, um, that, that's a great way. I mean, you know, you've given some great advice about the first diagnosis, how to cope um, and the, the social aspect, but what about the interpersonal relationship of the person diagnosed with dementia and their loved one, whether it be a parent, a spouse, um, I've seen the dynamic in my family change vastly. And that's one of the hard things to cope with, I think. You know, you you build a relationship, there's a foundation for it, you're you have your roles in that um, relationship, and then all of a sudden things start to change. Um, to to me as a child, that's been hard to watch with my mom and dad. Um, and I've it's certainly been difficult for my dad um, with my mom. So yeah. when we talk about living well with dementia, how do we overcome those changes in interpersonal relationships? Uh, one of the hardest things is to recognize we can't have what we used to have. And we are going to have to be willing to let go of it to some extent. Doesn't mean give up on it, but I can't have it be the thing that guides me because I one of us is changing perhaps morning to night or day to day, one over time. But the hard part is to recognize trying to duplicate what I had before is going to result in a feeling of this isn't right and this isn't enough. So we actually, if we've been a partnership like a couple, it may mean we need to spend time apart, but each of us should be hooking up with somebody else, not one of us being left alone. So we want to do a little inventory on, OK, so let's look in our past when we weren't together. What kinds of things were we doing and who were we with doing them? And if the other person was a solitary person, 
I need to be really thoughtful then to give them someone to be with who knows how to deal with solitary. Um, not a chit chatter, not a in your space kind of person, because they're going to live better and well if they have a sense of being solitary uh, and yet having a possibility. So some people living with dementia opt for animals, service animals uh, and service dogs are very effective because that dog becomes the partner and the dog is trained to stay with the person but also that dog has a placement chip. So if the person gets turned around or not in the right place, the dog can be tracked and the person could be found. But we also know that dogs draw people. And so new people are being introduced, but the partner is not the new people. The partner is the dog. And so many people who don't want to be with humans all the time, they live better when they have animals that are their support animal. So we're getting um, some questions in. Um, one viewer is saying, um, how do we deal with the disappearing friend syndrome? It's almost mm -hmm. as though people feel or Alzheimer's is contagious. Yeah, that unfortunately um, is a very common phenomenon. And it's because we don't train people to be friendly. Um, People want the friendships they've had. They don't know how to sustain friendships that change. And people get nervous and anxious. And then they say the perfectly awful thing. So how, how is she doing in front of her? <laughs> it's like, but at the same time, if I don't know how to have a conversation with you, then coming over starts to feel awkward and uncomfortable. And if I come and I bring my big plan, like we're going to look through the we're going to look through the um, photo album of when we were in college and I bring it out. And you go, I don't want to look at that stupid thing. Because where you are in your dementia, that's just not what you want to do right then. The friend isn't prepared for that. And so the fr to have the friend be able to say, oh, so you don't want to do that. So would you rather. I'm going to bring my photo album, but I'm going to say, oh, I brought a photo album. Would you rather look at it or would you rather go out for a walk? Because the cool thing about walking is it's an action that we can talk and walk. and We don't have to make a lot of face contact. And what you can start to do as a friend is go, oh, look at that building. Wow, look at those colors. That's interesting, huh? And the person could go, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. And I said, tell you what, let's go this way. Or would you rather go that way? Well, we can go this way. So I have to recalibrate my friendship for the abilities of the person. And what I would say is, if I have disappearing friends, I need to look around for new friendships. Um, but my person may or may not be comfortable initiating friendship anymore. So in your opinion, um, you know, when you get that diagnosis, there's a period of time that we've spoken about where it's very isolating and, and very, uh, you know, the family's almost in shock. And then you start to live life a little bit. Um, some people reflect on caring for themselves. I mean, the person who has the diagnosis. So in your experience, what is it that works best to really empower the person with dementia to understand this isn't a this is this is not a death sentence maybe yet right maybe right. It, it does mean that you have a condition in your brain but that will you know your your life um style will change immensely and your health will change immensely according to this disease you have however it's not a switch it's not like all of a sudden wow you're on this slippery slope like for me i always was surprised about the fact that like some days you think, oh, she's not doing that badly. And other days you're like, oh, my gosh, she's, she can't remember anything. So it's, it's definitely a pattern more yeah. like this rather than this. It so, is. Yeah, for sure. So how, uh, talk to us a little bit about self-care and how people, I've heard it, I've heard it from both perspective. I've heard um, when people get a diagnosis, often lethargy kicks in. They don't feel inspired to do anything. They just want to stay home. And then there's other scenarios where people are running marathons and taking control of their life. So tell, talk to us a little bit about how you achieve that self-empowerment yeah. coming from a person with diagnosis. 
Yeah. So one of the tricky parts is being aware that some dementias are more lethargy producing or apathy producing. So vascular dementia, unfortunately, and sometimes frontal temporal dementia have more one of the characteristics could be that I have a hard time finding things I care about anymore. I, I don't care. Uh, and it's not because I don't want to care. It's because the chemicals and the structures of my brain make it very difficult for my brain to find pleasure in engaging in things. I can't find the pleasure bump, pump. I, I can't get myself going, energized. Whereas for other dimensions, it's not. And if apathy is an issue, I would really recommend family members recognize you need you need a third party in here because you will find that it feels like you're trying to move lead weight and it starts to feel like it's deliberate and you won't even try. You're not even getting up. And so it turns into a battlefield. And unfortunately for some dementias, it is a symptom. And for those people, they're going to need extra different kind of support than in general because the part of their brain that causes them to feel I like, I want, I it makes a difference to me, just isn't working right then. Um, and so you need somebody who's really skilled at helping get it back on track. And yet at the same time, being able to recognize it may never come back fully. On the other hand, for people who do have some still ability to do it, not because of brain failure, but they're feeling anxious and nervous or they, they, they aren't sure, one of the things to do is to start with baby bites. So tell you what, how about, would you mind, would you rather help me in the yard or would you rather go out and do something with Mary? So what I wanna produce as a support person is an either or option. I don't care which one it is. Each one would have value. Helping me in the yard is going to be a body brain thing. It's going to be familiar. It's just the two of us. We are out of the house. We are out in the world. We are doing something that's going to be heavy work, um, but we're doing it in a space where you can always have the option to get back in the house. Go out with Mary is going to be an adventure. Uh, it's going to be different. It's going to be sort of exciting. It's going to be traveling about doing something. It's not as defined, but it's also potential for more fun because me, we're working in the art. Mary's going to go do something interesting. But the critical piece was a choice. And we need to make sure that Mary understands this needs to be a very short visit. So um, it's, it's also empowering the person to make that decision rather than just saying, get out of your chair and let's go for a walk. You know, you're giving them a choice, oh, to empower yeah. Them, yeah. which it does work. Um, so there's, there's a ton of questions coming in right now um, and I wanna get to as many um, of them, but okay. On that, on the activities, um, yes. we, we just had someone write in saying, how do you find activities for the person with dementia that fit their old interests, but aren't seen as demeaning and childish, right? Yeah. I mean, there is a tendency, we're all guilty of it, to start yeah. to talk to the person with dementia like a child. Yeah. Um, so what do you do about that? So, so simplify, don't babyfy. So if the person used to always, let's say they were an accountant, what I might ask is, could you look at this for me and give me your opinion? I have, this is what I've done and I keep it fairly simple and I'll put a line of paper there. And it really does mean that I have to know what I think they're capable of, but I put a line of paper and I go, these numbers. Now, should I put a, I, I've never done this before. Should I put a minus sign in front of that to, to indicate it's a negative? Or is there another way? Is Should I move it to the other column? And I'm really working with their expertise, but I have to really know enough about what they enjoy and what they used to do to be able to ask questions that more than likely they'll be able to answer. And they may even say to me, God, you really are stupid. And I have to be able to go, you know what? You're absolutely right. That's why I asked for your help because I feel like you know this stuff and I don't. And I could use your assistance here. 
Um, people like to feel, most people like to feel like they can help in some way. And so picking things that give them a sense of value and purpose that play to their strengths and then really truly respectfully wanting their opinion. So if I know that in the past she liked flower arranging, I might bring simple flowers and say, I'm looking for whether or not there are three vases here, which vase should I work with? Because honestly, everything I've tried looks like a mess. And really it's, it's basically, could we try these three vases? Well, I just now created three activities rather than just one. And whatever she does with it, I can look at it and go, wow, let's take a picture of that one. Okay, now I'm gonna take a picture of the second one and now the third. So let's look at these three. Which one do you like the best? And whatever they say, it's an opportunity then. And I'm carrying some of the heavy lifting for the interaction but the person is starting to feel valued again. And it's, a, and it's not artificial, it's truly, I do value what you have to offer. I value our interaction. I value how we're building time together. Um, but if you don't really wanna do it, don't do it because you'll sound fake. Okay, so, um, and that's all great advice. Um, but there are times um, where mm -hmm. the person no longer is the person you recognize, right? No. And can be very hurtful. So we have a viewer who's um, written in and said, you know, how do you deal with a husband um, uh, and have been married many years, 47. Yep. At the end of the day, he says, I don't love you anymore. I want a divorce. Very mean and aggressive. It, yep. it, is it the disease talking? Because at the time it's real. So it feels yep. real. It's it these are very real. Hurtful things yeah. people are saying. So when we talk about living well and you know your loved one of many years suddenly turns around and says, I hate you, it's it's hard. That's hard. It, right. It's so beyond how, hard. What yeah. what does the caregiver do at that point? Because the hurt is already has happened, right? So yeah, we're all so human in this. The caregiver is a patient's human. So how do we equip ourselves to have that steely armor to say it's the disease talking, it's not the person. Well, and what I'm gonna say is part of it's the disease and part of it's what we've been doing, unfortunately, because nobody prepared us for this disease. And it's sometimes as simple as my husband, you know, has dementia and he says, Well, I don't I don't need socks. And I, without thinking, say, You do too need socks. You have blisters on your heels, you have diabetes, put on a pair of socks. And it's really my fear that he's going to develop problems with his feet. I can see his frustration with me, but I have a hard time often as the care person recognizing what in my voice didn't sound like the wife he married. <laughs> what in my voice sounds like my mother on a bad day. What in that voice and that behavior sounds like I'm trying to boss him around rather than I'm trying to help. And all I'm trying to do is help, but in that moment, my own distress level is so high. Um, I had no idea how, I mean, if I'd watched a video of myself, I wouldn't believe I sound like that. Um, and he is unable to come back from that. So for me, what it means is too much of this, not enough of this. Both people need, when I say people need time apart, we underestimate how much time apart. So when I'm with you, I can actually, and they can enjoy some time with us. The person who's doing the care partnering sometimes takes on too many roles too, for too many hours. And pretty soon you, you're not even thinking about what you're doing. You're just trying to do what you need to do. And so being able to pull back and say, I need time away. He needs time away. What he's really saying is, I need time away from you. It's intense. And at that moment, it feels like forever and always. But what might really be going on is we're spending way too much time in conflict around trying to live. And we need to live better by not trying to do this so much together so many hours. So this is, this is a crucial point you're making um, because... 
giving yourself a break, right? Both of you from each other, because the caregiving relationship is not one that you had previously. And suddenly, like I can see it with my parents, there's this codependency building and it doesn't always build in the most healthy way. Mm -mm. Um, And we're always saying like, dad, take a break, you know, um, go, go do something. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Exactly. Fine, Daddy. <laughs> so when when you when you're thinking about like what's normal, like what's a normal break? How much time should people give? And like in addition, there are people out there that don't have the resources. Oh, to I take know. Away. I got so it. So what do we do? We build community. I mean, and really and truly, what you're doing is helping to build community. We've got to start recognizing there is no nobody with a lot of money out there. That much money, most of us who could afford to pay somebody to be there, but we could take turns. So one of the things to realize is sometimes by building relationships with other people who are in similar situations, what we could start recognizing, you know, one night a week, the guys could go bowling and one of us could take them and they could go bowling and they might have a great time bowling and I can sit and just hang out because they're bowling with each other. And what it does is it allows me to realize, okay, I hang better with people who know my situation and my husband hangs better with people who have something going on with them too. So we're not trying to mix ourselves in with people who aren't like us, but we've got to start recognizing 24 seven is absolutely off the table. Most of us in married life work. And when we work, we don't There are very few of us who could work together and live together and sleep together and get up. But even doing that, we aren't in the bathroom caring for each other. I go in the bathroom, do my own thing, and he comes in and he does his thing. We may share space, but we don't complete tasks with one another. Dementia changes that. And I think recognizing mm -mm, unhealthy, Mm, it's just unhealthy for both of us because I'm getting distressed, you're getting distressed. I'm not sleeping well, you're not sleeping well. I'm socially isolated, you're socially isolated because we're we're actually not social when we're together. We're doing things and one of us is doing things to or for the other one and it feels uneven. Um, And then who has time for body and brain fitness and what am I eating and drinking? Well, I want a glass of wine. I want yeah. a beer. I, you know, I I need a bag of potato chips. Is what I need right now. Yeah. So, if you had to make a checklist for us about living well with dementia, um, if we had to, let's say, uh, you've 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 touched on a lot of things that a lot of people experience: um, the isolation, the communication, the interpersonal um, relationships. So, make a list for us. Tell us if we want to change things to live well with dementia from both the caregivers and the person with dementia's perspective, what should be on our list? First of all, take a baseline for yourself. How stressed out are you? And if your answer is incredibly, then let's figure out how to dial that down a little bit. What, what's coping strategies that decrease your stress? How well are you sleeping? You know, what's your sleep pattern right now? Because humans cannot live well, if they aren't getting enough sleep. I mean, and you've done the work, you know that sleep deprivation is high risk for developing dementia and of course other things. But what's your baseline on sleeping? If you don't even know what your baseline is, if you're not honest about your baseline, we're not going anywhere because we've got to be honest about where am I and where's the person who's living with dementia? Are we a good match? Are we not? Am I an early bird and they're a night owl? Ooh, we better get somebody in here because we're going to take each other over the edge. Um, because early birds and night owls do not match up. So that becomes a critical distressor. And then who do I have to talk to? Who do I have to share with? Who do I have to unload my grief with and celebrate my joy with? Who is it that I'm doing that with? And if both of us can't, what's our baseline? Who are we doing it? If we don't have anybody, who could we pick? Could it be by phone? Could it be by Zoom? Could it be something? And how frequently? And then, you know, what are we doing for our own 
wellness, our body, our brain health. What are we doing that's fun for our brain? What are we doing that's good for our body? What's your baseline? How often are you exercising? 20 minutes a day? Is it aerobic? How well are you doing fun things with your brain to stimulate your brain? How about the person living with? And then what are you eating and drinking? Are you nourishing and hydrating? Or are you eating for comfort and drinking for comfort? Where are you? Because if you don't know your baseline, you won't even know how much you've changed since when you look back. And so inventory, do an inventory and then pick one at least and start doing something because bringing something on versus trying to not do something is a much better strategy for starting. Okay, um, we have a question coming in and I think this is a really valid point. Um, and this viewer is asking, but aren't there times when the person with dementia needs the support of a parental figure? How do you know when it's proper to fill um, a parental role? Um, here's what I'd say, they do need, they do need an authority figure I would really take a hard look around at their world and see who's an authority for them already. Can there be somebody that's not my primary partner so that one person stands beside me and one person dishes the dirt? One person says to both of us, driving needs to stop. And if the person is able to, they say, well, but I don't understand, I'm a good driver. And the partner says, so you're telling us that driving should stop. Talk to me more about what's making you say that. So that the partner can be the question seeker, hear information. Oh, that's awful. Oh my God, that's horrible news that no more driving. Yeah, you were always, you've always been such a good driver. This is really hard to hear. And so I'm being your advocate, but what I'm really doing is sharing the grief of this news so that there is an authority figure, the authority figure lays down the law, but I'm there beside you. So you're not, it's not me shaking my finger. It's someone telling us this isn't okay anymore. And me saying, okay, so you're telling us this isn't okay. So what are our options? And I asked the question, what are our options? Because if you tell me this isn't okay or not, or not, you're taking something away. So what are some possibilities here? Well, we could talk about Uber or you could talk about whether or not you want to have somebody in your family do some driving. Well, I don't understand why I can't drive. Yep, dad, I hear you. You're not getting it. But what I hear the doctor saying is for right now, he doesn't want you driving. And he said, Uber or us, which one would you rather do, dad? But this is different than me saying, what did you hear the doctor say? Did you not hear that you can't drive? You've got to quit driving. I'm taking the keys. That's a mean parent versus somebody who's helping someone's brain let go of something really that was part of who they were um, and acknowledging how hard it is to let go of things we love or value. So, um we, we have a comment and it's actually sparked another issue in my brain. Um, the, uh, a viewer saying vascular dementia, Alzheimer's is what my husband has. I look at this man and see a physically good looking person. That is where the patience is very hard as I forget his brain is breaking down. So, you know, making this transition of wait, this is my old, this is my husband versus yes. looks this so is someone with a disease. Yeah. I think of people's head shrank like their brain shrank. So if the shrinkage was not sometimes inside the brain in, in the ventricles and as you part can see of, it like in your bicep or yeah, something, I could see where if your skull would shrink so that it matched the shrinkage. It would be so much easier. Um, it really would because our brain could see so clearly what our, our brains are picking up on, but we don't want Vision is our primary source of data. And so when I see someone that looks okay, it's really hard to not want them to be okay. And that also means what it means is when my husband doesn't look like he should, I have a really hard time seeing him as the man that he was, which is one of the challenges when people get to a place where they don't have that self-awareness of how they look and how they smell 
and that they're not brushing their teeth and their their mouths smell bad and they've left these clothes on for several days because their time awareness is bad. Um, and I go to see the person I care about and it's like, this is not my person. And then it's hard to like them. So it's this weird sort of back and forth thing. And it's hard for me to not want to fix them. And that's not living well. That's that sort of getting in that position again of having a weapon in your hand. Um, I, I actually want to bring this conversation a little bit into an area that comes up a lot that not a lot of people talk about, which is the um, physical relationship between two people. Um, when you have a, di a, a dementia diagnosis, um, does that mean the end to having a physical sexual relationship with one another? Not for sure in the early stages, although in the early stages, some people do experience decreased sex drive. Um, it's not that uncommon for many dementias to actually, everything else is sort of on the front burner. And having a sexual or intimate physical relationship is not in that moment just what everybody's focused on. Um, other people really cling to the physical element of it because early on, intimacy and those abilities are still strong. Sometimes there's a real mismatch, though, um, where one person's dementia, frontal temporal is an example, with that comes up fairly or young onset Alzheimer's disease, where there may be an increased drive for more sex, more intimacy, and yet the ability to see the other person's point of view and know whether they're enjoying it and care whether they're enjoying it can be greatly diminished. I think where it really becomes hard is in the middle of the disease where um, my desire and interest and understanding of our relationship is starting to shift. And the way I've heard it described, I've not had the experience of having a husband with dementia at this point in my life, not to say that I will never, but at this point, it's like taking a teenager to bed and not at all. I mean, I'm, and when you feel that shift that you're more in a care support mode than you are in a spousal mode, um, I think it is really important to weigh out how am I feeling about that? Um, do I want an emotional intimacy, but not a physical intimacy? And if so, then we have to start creating more space in places and in behaviors that create these boundaries that didn't exist. And yet, if we're going to live well, we've got to acknowledge that's just where I'm at. Um, and there's not a wrong or a right. It's where I'm at. If the other person is different, we've got to create some opportunities to get that more visually distinct. So it may mean switching from a queen size bed to two, you know, doubles plus. It may mean moving to another sleeping space. It may mean making sure I'm never walking around in nightgowns. Um, it may mean I close the bathroom door and, and lock it when I'm going to take care of my needs. So, I mean, we all have to figure out where we are, but I think not saying it makes it feel wrong. And it's like, there's not a wrong or a right. It's figuring out how you're going to live through this life and live it well. How how important is um, I mean we 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 uh, being patient we cover a lot of the lifestyle research um, a lot around exercise health foods etc. But from your experience, you're around a lot of families. Um, how important once you have a diagnosis is the health component? Really looking after your body, exercise, uh, you know, taking care of yourself. How much does that lead to a better life together? Oh, it's remarkable. I mean, it really does. It again, it's not pushing at each other, but supporting one another, opportunities for each other. But also notice when, you know, I like to run. He doesn't like to run. Well, should I give up running to be with him? Or should I find someone who does something he likes to do so I can do what I like to do? And at the level, I need to do it to get what I need out of it. So if somebody in my life is more of a walker, I need to look around and say, I need somebody to walk with him so I can go running because it's both emotionally distressing, but it also limits me. And what we know is both of us would benefit from exercise for sure, but it needs to be based on 
you know, what we both like. If we can find something we both like, like dancing or maybe boxing, you know, there's all kinds of possibilities. Suddenly we may find some new spaces to occupy um, so that we have this fun together. It's different. It's just different. And life doesn't stop when you get to pinch. It, it just changes. And so not giving up on different, I think, is one of the hardest things. And it's like, oh, so it's all over. It's like, well, why do we think that? I mean, yes, you have some destroyed brain, but that doesn't mean you're not still living for a long time in some cases. Yeah, and it's it's amazing. I mean, and, and I, I use this example, and I hope um, Phil and Jeff don't mind, but we have patient, patient advisors who are working at being patient now. And what they've given to us is remarkable. They've both had diagnosis for, you know, three, four years, five years, and they have joined our team and are so capable and yeah. you know they've get, been given this diagnosis but yet they have so much to offer and that was a real eye opener to me because um unfortunately when you're given a diagnosis it's it's more like you're pushed into this area oh. where you know oh you're not a normal person anymore and what we're what our eyes have opened to is like, wow, there's still a lot of life and intelligence that, um, that, you know, people with a diagnosis have to offer. But the way that society kind of pushes them away is is really hard. I mean, it's it, it really is hard, um, I could imagine, to be labeled, I'm a person with dementia. Yeah. And are, we're not quite to a place yet where it says, yeah, so? I mean... I'm, you know, I'm a woman who's, you know, older and I have arthritis. So, so it's changed some things, but it doesn't mean it's stopped everything. And you know what? I found some different ways to do things. And I think more and more people with awareness, and I think that's the tricky part, is some people who live with dementia have awareness and some don't. And if you're living with someone who doesn't have awareness, this all feels like pie in the sky crap. Um, quite honestly. But if you're living with someone with awareness, you know, you get it that I can be aware. And if I'm aware, I can make shifts and changes. I have a hard time sustaining them sometimes. So I might need a bump or a pump. And I might need you to think about how you say that. You know, I noticed you didn't go exercise this morning. Were you going to go this afternoon or did you have another plan? Versus you said you were going to start exercise. That's the mother coming out again. And instead being that support person, oh yeah, I didn't feel like it. Uh, so you weren't feeling like it. Tell me about that. So was it, were you tired because you didn't sleep well or it was just hard to get going? It was hard to get going. Well, tell you what, how about if we try something? So trying something will go somewhere. Whereas, well, if you don't get out, you know you're going right back to, it's just so tempting to try to do a fix rather than support. And that's, that's, that's a really key point to make. Um, Tipa, thank you. I know you helped so many people around the world impacted um, by this disease. And you know your, your advice is so solid, it's so good, it makes so much sense. Um, so you know, hopefully with this talk, we can empower people to live well with dementia. It's not you know, necessarily, you don't have to treat it like a death sentence. There's a lot of life worth living. And you know, thank you so much for helping us see that. Take those baby steps forward. And that's how you get somewhere, frankly. So Thanks. if you want to learn more about Tipa Snow, is it tipasnow.com, Tipa? Okay, go to, please go to our website, tipasnow.com. As always, we post these talks on beingpatient.com. You can sign up for our newsletter to hear about more, um, more of our coverage and, and these talks. And we thank you so much, Tipa, for your time. And we look forward to having another future chat with you. Thanks for the opportunity. And thanks for all you do. Thank you. Bye-bye. Absolutely.